I'm not at home on crowded streets. They don't appeal to me. In the heart of God's cathedral is where I want to be. So I take the outside circle when the stars are growing dim. See the morning light play shadows all along the canyon rim. I feel the prairie wake and flush a dozen bob white quail as I guide my favorite cow horse down a rough and rocky trail. I ride through mountain country, gaze across the great divide as I trail majestic mustangs that no man will ever ride. A red-tailed hawk is screaming as he searches for his prey. The cottonwoods are yellow on this crisp November day. I crave the open spaces where the sky is blue and wide. Somewhere west of Wall Street is where my heart and soul reside. Thanks for riding along with us as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street. Today we're taking a long look at the Texas Longhorn. Somewhere West of Wall Street is brought to you by our friends at the American Quarter Horse Association, celebrating 75 years by Cactus Saddles, the choice of champions, by Cactus Ropes, let's go rope, by Resist All Hats, best all around, by Cactus Gear, by heel matic real people, real results, by Cowboys and Indians Magazine, the premier magazine of the West, by Jerry Durant Auto Group, a Texas tradition for 45 years in Weatherford, Texas and by the National Ranching Heritage Center, located on the campus of Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. In the developing years of the American West, life depended on few essentials for survival. Those resilient pioneers forged the way for our future, and that's why their stories of self-reliance are still talked about. At the National Ranching Heritage Center, we believe not only in preserving that legacy, but also in nurturing it. Help preserve the image of our nation's livestock industry by becoming a member of the Ranching Heritage Association. Visit ranchingheritage.org to become a part of a living legacy. Jerry, I heard something pretty amazing. Y'all now have fourth generation customers. Well, Red, when you treat people like family, they keep coming back. Looks to me like Jerry's has become a family tradition. We work hard to make sure our customers have a great buying experience. And almost 50 years, what keeps you going? After all these years, I still love putting the right person in the right vehicle at the best price. We have the Spanish to thank for the American icon, the cowboy. For without the horse and the cow, there would be no cowboy. And it was the Spanish that brought them both to this continent. When the Spaniards financed Columbus' second voyage to the New World in 1493, they insisted that he bring some horses and some cows. And that's how we got horses on this continent. And that's how we got cattle. The cattle were horned cattle from the Iberian Peninsula. And that's where Spain is located. Although in the beginning, they were only on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, where Columbus first landed. Within a couple of hundred years, they were grazing in Mexico. And many of the cattle at that time went wild and through the natural process of selection, those with the longer and sharper horns were the ones that survived. They also became leaner and tougher, more able to survive heat and drought. In 1690, about 200 head of these longhorn cattle were driven north out of Mexico into what became known as Texas and they delivered them to a mission on the Sabine River. However, in 1693, fearing an attack by Indians, the mission was abandoned and the missionaries fled back to Mexico. The Longhorns, though, stayed and they flourished. By the time of the Civil War, nearly 300 years after the cattle first set foot in America, millions of Longhorns ranged between the mesquite-dotted sandy banks of the Rio Grande to the sand beds of the Sabine on the east side of the state. Many of the Texas boys who finally made it home after four long years of civil war found little to come home to. Often they discovered that their farms and ranches had been abandoned, their fields were unplowed, and their cattle were roaming wild. As a matter of fact, there were lots of cattle roaming wild and most were unbranded. They were survivors of Indian raids, cattle that had been scattered by stampedes and weather. And there were those that had been abandoned after ranch after ranch failed. But some of those boys came home from the war and saw an opportunity in the wild cattle. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, Philip Danforth Armour opened a meat packing plant in Chicago. 
It was called Chicago's Union Stockyards, and it opened on Christmas Day of that same year. Then in 1867, Joseph G. McCoy opened a cattle shipping facility at the railhead in Abilene, Kansas. McCoy was going to ship cattle by rail to the Union Stockyards in Chicago, and he sent word to Texas cowmen that he was paying $40 a head for cattle delivered to Abilene. It didn't take long before those Texas cowboys were gathering those unbranded cattle and either selling them to ranchers or putting a herd together to take north. The first herd to go up what would become the Chisholm Trail, which was established by Jesse Chisholm, belonged to O.W. Wheeler and his partners. Wheeler in 1867 bought 2,400 steers in San Antonio for about $4 a head and trailed them north up the Chisholm Trail through Indian Territory and into Kansas. Many more herds followed. That first year, McCoy shipped 35,000 head out of Abilene. The number doubled each year until 1871 when he shipped 600,000 head. Other trails were soon developed, and among them being the Western Trail, which went from Texas crossing the Red River at the famous Doan's Crossing, through Indian Territory and on up to Dodge City, Kansas, which also had built a set of shipping pens. And then there was the Goodnight Loving Trail, established by Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving. And it went through West Texas, crossed the Pecos River at Horsehead Crossing, and then went up through New Mexico into Colorado. It was Good Night and Loving on which Larry McMurtry's book, Lonesome Dove, was based. The trails were long. The Chisholm and Western trails, which started in South Texas, were each about 1,000 miles in length. And the Good Night Loving Trail, even longer because of its route. The typical herd was 1,500 to 2,500 head and moved only 10 to 12 miles per day. 10 to 15 cowboys were needed to make the drive, and each cowboy might have as many as five horses. Cowboys worked in shifts to watch the cattle 24 hours a day, keeping them ahead north during the day and watching them at night to prevent stampedes as well as theft. Indians were a problem, as were outlaws. The crew also included a cook who drove a chuck wagon and a horse wrangler who was in charge of the remuda. The cowboys would change horses at least once and sometimes twice a day. The chuck wagon carried each man's bedroll as well as the food. The cowboys ate bread, beef, beans, and coffee, three meals a day. Wages were about $30 a month, paid when the herd was sold. The Longhorns' characteristics made them ideal for long drives. They could go long distances without water, rustle their own food, fend for themselves, swim rivers, and survive the desert sun and winter snow. Over a period of 25 years, 10 million head of Longhorns were trailed north to railheads. By the late 1880s, certainly by the turn of the century, the long cattle drives were over. The days of the open range were gone. Ranchers were fencing their land and the Kansas farmers started blocking the passage of the Longhorns because of the Texas fever that the bighorn cattle carried. Texas cattle were immune, but the domestic herds that the Longhorns came in contact with on their long trips north were not. Then ranchers, not needing the hardiness of the Longhorns since they were no longer making the long drives, started crossing their Longhorns on some of the English breeds looking for a more beefy animal. Longhorns were bred almost out of existence. It took less than 40 years from the start of the trail drives until the longhorn cattle came closer to extinction than the buffalo. By the 1920s, only a few small herds remained. In 1927, the federal government stepped in. Only a handful of Texas longhorns were roaming the ranges at that time, all in private herds. But Congress appropriated $3,000 and assigned Forest Service Rangers Will C. Barnes and John H. Hatton to the task of preserving the Texas Longhorn as a part of the American heritage. Barnes and Hatton inspected more than 30,000 head of cattle and found only 20 cows, three bulls, and four calves that were, in their opinion, purebred Texas Longhorns. These cattle were taken to the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge near Lawton, Oklahoma. 
and they served as seed stock for what would become the wildlife refuge herd. Then in the early 1930s, the state of Texas formed its own herd, placing them in various state parks with the help of historian and writer J. Frank Doby and his friend Graves Peeler. Doby was writing a series of articles on the breed and in 1941 would publish the book, The Longhorns. And Peeler, who was a former Texas Ranger, had grown up around the Longhorns that his father raised. And after the wildlife refuge herd in Oklahoma had increased to a few hundred, annual sales of surplus animals were held and cowmen at first purchased them as curiosities. But then they rediscovered the Longhorns longevity its resistance to disease, its fertility and ease of calving, and the breed's ability to thrive on marginal pastures, all of those things that allowed it to survive from the very beginning and made it the ideal animal for the long trails north to the railhead. In 1964, Charles Schreiner III of the Y.O. Ranch near Mountain Home, Texas, took the lead in organizing the Texas Longhorn Breeders Association of America, which was formed in Lawton, Oklahoma. At this time, there were less than 1,500 head of genuine Texas Longhorn cattle in existence, and a third of those were either in the federal refuges, the state of Texas herd, zoos, parks, or other private herds. Those founders of the association said they wanted the Texas Longhorn and its link with American history to be recognized, but they also wanted to recognize the present breeders and to encourage others to develop and maintain herds. Once the association was formed and promotion of the breed began, numbers started coming up in a hurry. And today the association is headquartered in Fort Worth in the historic Stockyards area and boasts approximately 4,000 members. Since the association was formed, they have registered more than 600,000 head of Longhorn cattle. One of the reasons for the Texas Longhorns uh, growing popularity in beef herds was because of its meat and a diet conscious population's desire for lean beef. It's lower in saturated fats and has less cholesterol and calories than chicken. But it wasn't just the meat. Texas Longhorn Bulls became the bull of choice for first calf heifers of other breeds due to the lower birth weight of the calves. Also, Texas Longhorns breed well into their teens. But on top of that, it's kind of neat to drive by somebody's ranch and see some old longhorns standing out in their pasture. No two of them alike. They all differ in color pattern, size, and horn length. And if the Texas longhorn is the living symbol of the Old West, it's an old breed with a new future. In just a moment, we're gonna travel to Shackleford County and visit with our good buddy, Chuck Wagon Cook, rancher, historian, Cliff Tyner. We'll be right back. Hi folks, I'm Red Stegall, and I believe in keeping our country strong with products made right here in the USA. Since 1927, Resist All has been known as the cowboy hat and produces over 3,000 a day in their Garland, Texas facility. Resist All uses the finest quality fur to manufacture their own hat bodies and is the true measure of X quality. From country music stars to ranch and rodeo cowboys, Resist All has been manufacturing headwear for almost a century right here in the USA. For perfect practice, the Serious Roper's only choice is Helomatic. Used and endorsed by Clay O'Brien Cooper, Rich Skelton, David Key. Helomatic's patented hop simulates real live steer action like no other product on the market. From the toe behind sleds and machines to the bones heading dummy, and now Joe Beaver's next calf roping dummy, Helomatic gives every roper perfect practice. Cliff, what do you think it was like going up the trail with 2,000 of those things that you're in control of, or trying to control? You know, they had the job cut out for them. And you had to stay out there at all hours of the day to try to, and when they first started out from South Texas, to try to control them. And, I mean, it would have been hell for a while until you kind of got them trail broke. So. And you weren't going but 10 miles a day. Oh, exactly. Now, these animals saved the West. 
Animals like this created an economy in Texas that wasn't there before the war, the Civil War we're talking about. Right. And so these animals, they say there were 10 million of them moved from Texas to the Kansas Railheads. Now, when, when we decided that we wanted to save that breed as a breed, you were kind of involved in that, weren't you? You were around during the formation. Yes. Well, the early, the, when they first started to try to preserve them was like in 1927. When uh, you weren't there in 19. No, I wasn't there in 27. <laughs> Not <laughs> too many years later, decided there's going to be this herd breed was going to be extinct. So they gathered up the best specimens they could find throughout the Southwest. They can even head to Mexico and wherever. And they formed that Texas Longhorn Breeders Association of America try to preserve the true Texas Longhorn. What were, the, what were the things that they looked for that you still look for when you're breeding these longhorn cattle? They'd be very clean underneath, not a whole lot of shed. Their ear won't, won't have that, that your ear flop ear, one thing, and you'll have that typical Texas twist. That are some of the main traits, your color, that you, you see your, uh, like your orange and white spotted, your black and white spots. Uh, there'll be some true blacks. Uh, reds, but you were spotted cattle, but you want them clean, long lines, no, a uh, lot of ear on them, but you'll see that, that Texas twist. But they're, they're pretty cattle. Yeah, they are. And you know, the thing about these cattle, you know, you can turn them in some harsh country where a lot of other cattle won't survive. And if they run out of grass, you'll find them browsing on trees or eating prickly pears or mesquite beans or, I mean, they, they're thrifty hardy cattle and that's the reason those cattle could trail. Cliff, thanks so much for taking the time to visit with us. Really enjoyed it. Well, you're mighty welcome. Glad to have you and any time. Come you back see us. Hang around because we're going to go down to Liberty Hill, Texas to John T. and Betty Baker's place and talk some more about Longhorns. Great place. <laughs> you folks stay with us. We'll be right back. If you still don't have your copy of Barbecue Biscuits and Beans, friends, Here's your chance. If you order one of these books, you can learn how to cook some mouth-watering dishes in Dutch ovens or over the open fire, just like Bill and Cliff do. Here's how you order. Give us a call at 800-457-7966 or look us up on our website, inthebunkhousetv.com. It's cowboy cooking at its finest. Give us a call. Thanks, my friends. I think we're a big family. Like, we all take care of each other. And, you know, just the between the horses and the people in the industry, I think it's a great thing. It's my whole life. It's not really, you know, an option for me anymore. It's just what I am. It's easy to be proud of the best horse in the world. We are AQHA proud. I am AQHA proud. I am AQHA proud. I am absolutely 100% AQHA proud. We're at the Sunrise Ranch outside of Liberty Hill, Texas with John and Betty Baker. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Longhorns in this beautiful home. How long have you guys been in the Longhorn business? 45 years. 45 years. And how'd you get into it? Well, uh, I'm gonna make a long story a lot shorter. Guy wanted me to fly with him over to a Longhorn sale. He just got his pilot's license, didn't have much experience. I'd been flying several years. So I flew over to the Wyo Ranch with him, landed over on a little short runway and went to a sale. I enjoyed going to it. Didn't buy anything, cause I was just a guest. He invited me to go again. And the next year that started the, the timer clicking. <laughs> Bought my first Longhorn right there. <laughs> what attracted you to the Longhorn breed? The more I learned about the cattle, the thing that really was attractive to me, I worked about 18 hours a day, seven days a week during it, building a business. And I didn't really need anything else to occupy my time. So I needed something that was uh, low maintenance. And I learned you didn't have calving problems. You didn't have disease problems typically. And I said, that sounded like the right thing for me. So from that point on, 45 years ago, we've just grown. Of course, they're a Texas icon. So today you raise the Longhorns uh, for, the, for the beef? Yes, sir. A lot of people don't know too. You say, what do you do? What are Longhorns good for? Well. They're good for whatever purpose you wish to have them. Whether you want some mobile yard art, 
so you can sit on the porch on Saturday morning and uh, look at them graze while you drink your coffee, if that's mm. applicable. And what about the meat? Low cow, low fat, uh, determined by A&M, and I think that's unique. That's uh, documented evidence uh -huh. through some research that was done several years ago. And so uh, you will not find as much intramuscular fat on these cattle as in others. You don't find as much uh, exterior fat, if you will, on those mm -hmm. cattle. There's a niche market for longhorn beef mm -hmm. that many people scattered over the United States uh, supply various people. You don't find in your local uh, big stores, typically. Uh, but there is longhorn meat marketed if someone wishes that. Pretty lean. I sure appreciate you folks taking the time to visit with us. Hi. Awfully good to see you Thank again. You. Good to see Betty. you. Thank you. Thank you. You folks stay with us. We'll be right back. In the 70s and early 80s, the boys and I traveled this country border to border and coast to coast. And during that time period, we recorded 11 albums of Western Swing and Honky Tonk music. We now offer those recordings on a two CD package entitled Classic Red Steagall. Add this once in a lifetime package to your collection of our cowboy songs and coins. Call us at 800-457-7966 or order online at inthebunkhousetv.com. Elegant lines sketch a portrait of eye-catching curves. Concealed by this chic exterior lies the strength of an oak. A partner sturdy through the blows, yet soothing for the distant road. I am your saddle. I am Cactus. Well, as you've heard me say many times, this is my favorite part of the show when we pause to give thanks for all the things that are ours. Today, for our song of inspiration, listen to Don Edwards. Amazing grace, how sweet the sun that saved a rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm blind. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace that fears. How precious, dear, that grace of The hour I first believed Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come Was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining. The sun We've no less days To sing God's praise Than when we first begun Amazing grace How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 
was blind, but now I see. Well, as my old daddy would say, we got this one saucered and blowed. Thanks for riding along with us. We hope we taught you something about the Longhorn you didn't know or maybe brought back an old memory. Before I leave you, I want to give you something to think about till next week. John McNulty said, the cow is nothing but a machine which makes grass fit for us people to eat. Be sure you join us this week on your local radio station for Cowboy Corner and join us right here next week as we explore another trail somewhere west of Wall Street. Adios, my friends. This has been a Thunderhead production in association with Superior Productions.